What are different methods we can use to read the Bible? That's what we're going to talk about today. Take time. Study God's Word. It'll change you. Gail Davis. Today we're going to continue our conversation about studying the Bible. We're going to look at different ways that you can look and interpret the Bible now that we talked about some main ways that you overview or see chapters or areas that you're going to read. We talked a little bit about the last time that there are ways that you look at the bulk of interpretation, the words of the people, the language and the culture, all that requires you to do a deep dive. But then there's also ways of tradition, people, personalities, going through their experience with God, analogies, parables, literal interpretations, allegorical interpretations, all different ways that you can do. And in the end, what Father Mike Schmidt says, it humbles us and that we should keep going. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to actually interpret the Bible. How can we look at very specific things? And there's a lot of different ways about doing this. And next week, we're going to talk specifically about the most popular one, which is what is called the inductive Bible study. And if you overlook it, if you do too fast, you'll say, oh, it's so hard. It's full of contradictions. I don't understand it. No, where does it say what God wants from us? And honestly, that's not really quite true. If you dig deeper, if you spend time in it, the thing I'm learning is how to dig deeper and how to look things up and how to get through the rough points. Boy, doing a Bible podcast, that'll teach you that in a hurry. But there have been times where I worried about what it is that the Bible said. Now I don't. There were areas in there that I thought were too complicated for a regular person to understand. Now, after digging into them, I find out, oh, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was. And then the other part of it, too, is things that may seem like contradictions are just two people describing the same thing or potentially describing different events. It's not quite what you think. But I think the best piece of advice I can give, and I'll give it to you right now, is don't be like the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were on the path to learning the best things they could about God. Instead, they used their knowledge of God more like a lawyer, where they could prosecute someone they didn't like, like Jesus, like John the Baptist. They could go after them and try their methods of tricking people into it. But instead, when you say, I understand that God is 100% mercy, 100% justice, 100% forgiving, and you don't go into it trying to look for traps, trying to look at places where you're going to be disappointed, then you start really learning something. And I think that is the whole point where God kept saying, listen, dig deep, hear me, bring it to your heart. You talk about something about trying to interpret what's going on. There's a word called hermeneutics, which just means this kind of method of interpretation. What is going on in this particular case? And one commentary I read said, welcome to our postmodern world. Pilate's question lives on. What is truth? John 18, 38. But the answer is, when we're Christians, there is a truth. And it is up to us to dig deep to go find it. And how can we take a human author with divine inspiration, the Holy Spirit, and dig deep and figure out what's going on. Now, of course, it's harder than we all think it is. Very good people on a hundred different denominations can read a piece and disagree about what it says. But for the most part, we understand the main message of it. We may disagree on points here and there, but for the most part, we agree on many things. And so biblical interpretation is not as horrible as we may give it to be. Some areas are clearly harder than others. Boy, I'm looking for the day when I go through Revelation in my Bible study podcast. Woo. Or Psalms. I'm not much of a poetry person. I think Psalms are going to be hard for me. But there's other areas where I'm more excited about it because I'm a history nut. So I think Acts is going to be interesting to me. I love reading letters of people in history. So I think the epistles are going to be fun and the history of the Old Testament, because I had seen so many of these places, I'm excited to get there. So parts for all of us, depending on who we are, are going to be easier or harder than what we think, just because of 
kind of how we're built too. So the basic idea is, I think, when you're looking at the Bible and you're trying to interpret it, is what does it just say? <laughs> just the basic message of what is said here. And with my Bible in small steps, that's really what I'm trying to go through. I'm trying to go through my point of view. What can they just look at it and get out of it, right? Uh, just a regular human being person. That's really what I'm going for in my podcast. That's the basic part of it. Then I can do a deeper dive and look at what other people say about it who are a little bit more trained than I am. Or if something is in the form of a history, what is the history trying to teach us? There is no history in the Bible that is just there for history lesson's sake. There is a message in there. There's a meaning this got put into the Bible. Why is it there? So it also requires us to look a little bit deeper to say, why is this here? What is the true meaning of the text, which is what we're trying to get to when we're doing a Bible study? And I think that a majority of the time, when you look at it at face value, you're going to be pretty darn close to exactly what that message means, what the actual text says. So when we're looking at it, we want to make sure that we're being in line with the context of the phase that we're being in line with the story, that we're in context with the entire story. Is he telling this story when he is in Jerusalem talking to the Pharisees? Or is he telling this story when he's talking to the crowd down by the Sea of Galilee? Is Daniel telling us something when he is persecuted? Or is he telling us something when he is looking towards the future? The context of what is said matters the most. Language, just in general, can be very confusing. Particularly when you talk about a language like Hebrew, where there's no vowel markings, and it's very hard to tell whether we're talking about something in the past or the future. And then you have to look at the context of even the sentence. If you say, someday Israel will be saved and he will be the Prince of Peace, the Holy God, Mighty One, well, that's clearly something in the future. I didn't quote that exactly. But if they say, my father, what, before I was born had an ox. Well, clearly the context of it is a story in the past. So we understand that. So understanding where it is in a particular passage is important to it. Then the concept, and I've heard this a couple of times, I, didn't, I never heard this before until I got started into the Bible study, but using the Bible to help interpret itself. The Bible has a very streamlined message through it. It has sin enters the world. God creates a rescue plan. The rescue plan spends thousands of years to get to the point where Jesus comes and then does the final act of it. That part's pretty easy. And there's not many places where the real message, the hardcore message of the Bible, of salvation, of forgiveness, of grace, of love, is contradicted. So we're going to take the bulk of what the Bible says and apply it to the passages we're reading. And sometimes that's very hard to do. Everybody in the Bible came from the beginning. They're all God's people. Everyone on this planet is God's people. It is just whether or not those people accept the gifts that God is giving or not. But using the Bible to understand hard points in the Bible is a very good way to go. It helps you understand everything in context of the bigger story. And then we also have to look at what the author's intentions are. Is the author trying to show us someone doing the right thing? I see a lot of times, and particularly when I wasn't a Christian, they'll say, well, look at this person. He gave his daughter to sleep with this other man. Is that really what God wants? No, that is not what God wants. God never said to do that. If you look at it in the original intent, these people are also breaking the rules God gave. We also are breaking the rules God gave us. It's a continual thing that we constantly do the wrong thing. And the Bible is not a PR piece. So we are going to see David mess up massively. We're going to see Solomon turn screwing up into an almost factory-like process of having 700 wives and concubines. We're going to see people fail and God still loving them. So what is the actual message? Is it go be like David? Or is the real message, God forgives? God continues to work through you regardless of what you do. 
He wants that relationship with us. He wants us to keep coming back with questions, keep coming back after our failures to him. We also have to take a look at the message about whether or not what is being said is for that person or for everyone. When Jesus tells people, hey, don't tell anyone about me, he's not saying that to us. To us, he's saying, go out there and tell everybody. That was a specific message for a specific person at a specific time. So we also have to look to see whether or not these messages are for a single person, for a single time, for a single circumstance, or for us too. That's an important piece of it. Because we could go in and say, well, God told so-and-so this and that, so therefore I can do this and that. That is not necessarily true. And I think, too, we have to take a look at the points of history. When we look at the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees, we're talking about people at a specific time. We're not called to be cruel to people now because someone in 2,000 years ago screwed up. This is a story of history. And you know what? Everyone screws up in history. We all start fresh. And we're going to treat every human being on this planet like a loved person. So we can't take a look to see that something that was being specifically said to a group of people, we can say to that group of people today. That's not how any of it works. And then we also have to, again, be sensitive. We have to look at what kind of uh, work this is. If we're talking about a different genre, if we're talking about history, if we're talking about parables, or is this a letter written to somebody? We're going to take a look at that too. And this article I'll put in the show notes had some good points in that some of the literature is law. You know, if your ox kills a person, then this ox must do X, Y, and Z, or you have to pay that person because of the ox. Then there's wisdom literature, which I smartly put at the end of my podcast, at the very end, because I figure I'll be better at this Bible podcasting by the time I get to Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Clearly, that seems really hard. But wisdom literature, points of view and poetry, and I did this and it turned out to be terrible. It was a terrible idea. I screwed up, those kinds of things. And then there's even the main gospels, which are the four writers who tell essentially the same story of their experiences, either as an apostle or with apostles, with Jesus, and then the acts that come after that. We learn why people who thought they had it right were missing the mark and what Jesus was trying to tell him. Then we get the church history. We get the epistles, which are going to be the letters back and forth to people because our church fathers were trying to instruct a certain kind of people about a topic that was near and dear to their hearts, or maybe they were screwing up. Revelation, which I guess would be the prophecy language. And in the Old Testament, we get history. We get outright literature, beautiful writing. We get stories of specific people like Job and what they are going through. Right now, I'm reading a book about how Job is a science book. I don't know how that's going to turn out, but books have specific meanings and they're written in specific ways. We have to also realize that the Bible has been interpreted. And so sometimes interpretation is very difficult. They go by different rules. We talked about it in different podcasts. I'm not going to go over that again, but some are literal and word for word literal. And some are, this is what was meant by it literal, even though it doesn't say the exact words word for word. And some of them are just outright. I just want you to have an easy time reading it. And so it's not very literal or accurate, but it's very easy to digest. We realize again that because these books are written by people, They have the flavor of their authors, even though they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. They still will sound like that person. Mark wrote in a very common man's Greek. Luke was probably the most educated of all the people who traveled with the apostles. His writing's beautiful. It's why everyone talks about Christmas with Luke, because he's so beautiful. John, obviously a very deep thinker. So we're getting the true message through their skills as a writer, their outlook in life, and the audience they're trying to address. And so this article that I said that I'll put in the show notes said that there's basically two points in trying to interpret the Bible. The first step is, what's our observation? And that's what the Bible in small steps is. What is my observation? 
And then the second step is what is the interpretation? So what does that mean? Which I do cover in that, but I usually try in that second stage to use people who are smarter than I am, like Matthew Henry, who writes very detailed commentaries. What does it actually mean now that we understand exactly what was observed? Now that we understand it, we interpreted it, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for the world today? What am I supposed to go and do now? Or was it a story that was meant to teach me something and I'm not supposed to do anything directly in this particular passage? These were messages for a specific person or a specific time and not meant for me, but I can learn a valuable lesson about it. This article talks a little bit, too, about not getting too wrapped up in hyperbole. Obviously, people will say things that are not what was meant, but it's meant to strike a very large point. Like, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Jesus is not calling for you to maim your body, but he's getting you to recognize the deep importance of sin and how we shouldn't take it lightly. Or metaphors. I can tell you the most conservative people when it comes to Bible interpretation still believe in metaphors. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. I am, I am the path. He is not literally a dirt path in the ground. He is not a door with a door handle and a, one of those eyeball things you look through, right? You know what he means. We all get what it means and so we don't have to be obtuse about it. We all know that the Bible will say things that are parables. And I heard this interesting thing, and I hadn't considered before, and I haven't had time to research it, but Jesus, it says, never uses names in parables. So if you can tell there are no names in what story he's telling, you can immediately identify it as a parable. Now, that's not to say when it says he healed a blind man, that's a parable. But when he's telling a story and he says, a man created a vineyard, and put a wine decanter in the center of the vineyard. That is a parable. It's very clearly a parable. But what does it mean then when we read about a man named Lazarus who could see from heaven to other people? Mm. So it's not always quite cut and clear about what we think, and it may be more difficult than we think, but for the most part, that's how we can tell. And then there's prophecy, that we are foretelling a time of a coming age. We see that in Daniel. We see that in Isaiah. We see it in Zechariah. We also see it with Jesus. And sometimes his prophecy is about what's going to happen to the apostles in their lifetime. And then quickly right after that, and what is coming at the end of the age of mankind. So you have to, at those quick turns, make sure you pay a lot of attention because that can be difficult. And then there's poetry. And one of the interesting things is that I took history. I took three years of history in college. It was so interesting to me because you don't get a lot of the poetry or even some of the jokes or even some of the word plays when you're not reading it in the original language. And I'm not telling you to go back and learn Hebrew or learn Aramaic, but I'm saying that there are things in there you probably don't even know they exist. Someday we're all going to have a good laugh about it in heaven. but. There were word plays when it came to house versus, you know, another type of word for bait. Bait is house. And it's a joke. It's a little bit of a joke, but you'll probably never get it without being able to read it in that Hebrew. So sometimes things are just said funny because it's poetry and it's using parallel structures. Sometimes it's phrased funny because it's a joke or it's a point that everybody speaking that language would have gotten like a, a phrase or a saying. We have all sorts of them in the English language. And some of it is apocalyptic, which is like prophecy, but to an oomph degree where it's very difficult. So when we look at the book of Revelation, are the seven stars and the seven headed beast, is that Rome and Greece and all the different nations on land right then? Or is that the future of the end? You know, so it's very difficult. And I'm really looking forward to that. But what I'm finding interesting, too, and you only really get to do this in the gospel, is reading the same story through the eyes of four different people. Because, again, they had four different audiences. Matthew was talking to Jewish people, and he was pointing out, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Mark was trying to explain to Romans what all of this meant. 
He was creating an action book for people who liked action. Luke was writing a beautiful piece of literature for Gentiles so that they could understand, probably new Christian Gentiles, what it was they were getting involved in. And John, boy, John is for that deep thinker, that person who really wants to know the oomph of what God was trying to tell us. And that's the Gospel of John. And some key ideas that you can look at when you're trying to interpret the Bible is look at sometimes the terms that are being used. I've been trying to do this more and more with my own Bible study because sometimes we understand the story better. When Jesus says to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, was he talking about Peter as being like the first pope? Was he talking about this rock of the gospel? And Peter was going to be one of the many stones inside this rock. When you look at the actual terms that were used, the phrases, Peter was a simple rock. But when Jesus said he's going to build his church on the rock, he was talking about this giant boulder cliff thing. And Peter being a part of that rock. And so you can understand things a little bit better if you understand what the actual word is. Sometimes where it says Jesus had compassion on the man and healed him, the word itself could not be expressed in the word compassion. It was like a heart-wrenching, I am sobbing on the inside kind of compassion. And so it helps to learn the actual words. Again, sometimes it helps to understand the structure of things. In some cases, when they go to arrest Jesus and they said, you know, are you Jesus? And he says, I am he. If you actually look at the structure of the sentence, he wasn't there. But the people who were interpreting the Bible probably thought the sentence sounded funny. And he just says, I am. And we know that I am is code word for Yahweh. He is calling himself God. And he does anywhere from eight to 16 I am's throughout the Bible because he is telling people. And when they would have heard it back in those days, they would have been like, whoa, what is he saying? Then you want to look at the differences like where terms and ideas are put together. And I've been finding that too. We, I just got through reading the part about where I was talking about being the salt and the fire and that salt is good. And both of those are purification methods. And when we see them together, then we kind of understand that phrase more as two things together. Or when Jesus curses the figs and then immediately goes inside of the temple and throws out all the sellers. Hmm. Maybe the temple is not producing fruit, just like that poor fig tree. And then the other question, you know, is essentially, who's he saying it to? Who's listening? What was the point of saying it? Is he talking to the Pharisees? Is he talking to the scribes? Is he talking to his apostles? The message is going to be a little bit different. So I hope that helps give you some ideas about interpreting the Bible and some ways of starting with it. It's really hard. But I want to tell you, as someone who just decided foolishly that I was going to do my own personal Bible study because I wanted to do a deep dive in the Bible and then decided to turn it into a podcast, I can't begin to tell you how valuable it's been to do a slow roll through the Bible and actually not just skirt away from those hard issues, those hard topics, those things that are hard to learn, but really invest time in it. I'm getting so much out of it, but the weird side effect of it is. It is giving me so much confidence in areas that I didn't have it before when it came to the afterlife, the prayer life. God is with us and cares for us. I mean, things that I believed, but boy, after reading this, it is like driven into my heart. Have you ever been afraid of heaven? And if you're going to be some sort of weird fat angel playing harps on a cloud and singing all day, I have. But now I hear the actual words of Jesus about heaven. We're going to be having dinner with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're going to be leaning at the table with him and all the people that Jesus brought in through his word and his forgiveness. Boy, that does sound exciting. So my challenge to you is try to just do a small step of this. Try to pick a very small piece of the Bible, maybe one of the epistles, and just try this interpretation method and see if you can't Get a little bit more out of it by doing some of these hints, maybe even getting a guidebook or a commentary that you particularly like and seeing if it doesn't help you. 
All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend. I would love to grow this community and eventually be able to offer something more, maybe something like a website where we could all chat about biblical topics. Obviously, when you started a podcast, it's a little harder to do, but I hope as we keep going, we'll start being able to reach out to more people and have some vibrant community conversations. I would really love that. And remember, in our path towards really understanding the Bible, starts with small steps. <laughs>